Hello everyone, welcome to another interesting and informative session of the analyst brought to you by Bajiram and Ravi. In today's session, we will discuss nine important articles as featured in the Hindu and Indian Express for your comprehensive understanding of the current affairs. The first five main articles are as follows. In the first topic, we will learn about what is emerging infectious diseases and the poor state of diagnosis infrastructure in our country. Then in the second topic, as several states have recently demanded for an independent and politically non-aligned judiciary, we will try to learn about the idea of separation of power. Then in the third topic, we will learn about what are the differences between judicial custody and police custody. Followed by the fourth topic, where we will try to inquire about the various lending facilities provided by International Monetary Fund in the backdrop of the recent economic crisis which has taken place in Kenya. Finally, in the fifth topic, we will learn about what is interest equalization scheme. Towards the end, there will be news snippets especially curated to help you excel in the prelims examination, so stay tuned. A recent case of Zika virus infection in Pune has renewed the concern about India's preparedness for diagnosing emerging infectious diseases, which forms an important component of your GS2 paper under the larger theme of health as well as government policies and interventions. So what are the issues which has been highlighted by the today's article? It says that zoonotic diseases are becoming the major share of all emerging infectious disease. So for example, out of 177 emerging infectious diseases, 130 of them is constituted by the zoonotic diseases. The question arises that what are these zoonotic diseases? Zoonotic diseases are basically the diseases such as COVID-19, Ebola, Nipah viruses which are actually being transferred from animals to the humans. And these zoonotic diseases as per the World Health Organization, they form 75% of all newly emerging infectious diseases as well as 60% of these infectious diseases which are being spread to humans are spread from animals. Thus, these zoonotic diseases are responsible for 2.5 billion cases of illness which are reported every year and for 2.7 million deaths worldwide each year. So obviously, these emerging infectious diseases of which these zoonotic diseases forms a major part of consist a major problem for our country. Now, the article also highlights certain other important issues which exist such as the poor diagnosis infrastructure. To understand which, we are going to take a case study of a Zika virus. So first, let's try to understand what is Zika virus. Zika virus is basically a disease or a pathogen which is spread by the biting of Aedes aegypti mosquito. So the vector is Aedes aegypti and it belongs to the family of flavivirus family of the viruses. Now keep this in mind that the another disease which is Dengue, it also has the very same vector that is Aedes aegypti and at the same time it belongs to the very same family of flavivirus viruses. Thus, let's say if I have been bitten by the Addis aegypti mosquito, how I will be able to realize that whether I have got the disease Dengue or Zika virus. Because even the clinical symptoms are very same that is hemorrhagic fever and hemorrhagic fever in both of the cases. Also, because of the climate change which is taking place, the kind of the rising temperature as well as the intense rainfall. So, for example, very recently, Delhi uh, had recorded the highest rainfall in the last 88 years. So, because of these condition, there is a rising temperature which is actually very idle for the development of such mosquitoes as well as frequent cases of water logging at several places is taking place as well because of our poor drainage infrastructure. So these are providing idle condition for both of the disease that is Dengue and Zika. Now there exists a very important difference between Zika and Dengue virus.
and that is that Zika virus can actually be transmitted from mother to the child. So if the mother is affected by the Zika virus and she is pregnant, if she will give birth to a baby, the Zika virus will also be transmitted into that baby. And that can actually lead to microcephaly among the babies, which is basically the small size of the brain which is caused because of the under development of brain due to the effect of Zika virus. Thus, it is very important for us to identify that whether I am suffering from Zika virus or Dengue virus. But the another major problem which lies in our country as per the drug regulator the drug regulator which is basically CDSCO or the Central Drug Standard Control Organization. According to it, there exists no approved diagnostic test for Zika in our country. Which basically means that if there are cases which are taking place of Zika and Dengue, we are unable to identify whether the patient is suffering from Zika virus. And this was exactly what was said in the ICMR study or Indian Council of Medical Research study that many a times the Dengue patients have Zika but they are not being identified and thus the adequate treatment is not being provided to them. Also, it is not that it is the sole case of Zika and Dengue. There has been reporting of multiple avian influenza outbreaks in our poultry industry as well as Kerala has seen various Nipah outbreaks in 2018, 21 and 23 as well. At the same time, because of the poor diagnostic facilities which are not readily available, we have been unable to detect of such virus outbreaks and control them. Now, again, when we are talking about this poor diagnostic infrastructure in our country, what does the data say? So, as per the study provided by Indian Council of Medical Research, currently in our country, there are around 1 lakh to 1 lakh 10,000 laboratories. How many of them has actually been aggregated by NABL? That is as low as 1039 in the year of 2019. So basically, there is a low focus on accreditation by these laboratories. So first of all, when we talk about the rural areas, such accredited laboratories are majorly absent. So you have to go to either travel as far as to some district or some major city to actually get yourself a good diagnosis. Even if that good diagnosis is being provided to you, many a time these laboratories, they are not accredited by the national authority. Thus, this is a major issue of the missing diagnostic infrastructure. The second major issue is that there exists an over-reliance on the Apex Institute such as your Indian Council of Medical Research or your CDSCO which is the Apex Regulator. So because we are relying so much on them, we have not been able to create a secondary level or at a district level a good chain of laboratories which can diagnose such diseases at immediate pace. The third major issue is that in other countries, there exists an emergency approval system for diagnosis of any outbreak of such disease, which is based on synthetic genome material. So let's say for example, what they have done, they have done a genome sequencing of majority of their population. So if we find out that one particular person in that particular area has been affected by the virus, then the diagnosis of whole of the population is done on the immediate basis because they share a similar kind of genome. In our country, on other hand, there is requirement of validation on the clinical trials. So first, the clinical trials of a large population will take place and only if then the government will get to know that yes, there is a widespread outbreak of such viruses, only then certain essential regulatory methods are approved. Thus, it actually delays the identification and the control of such disease. The next is the limitations which exist with GSED. So first, try to understand what is GSED. GSED is basically the global initiative on sharing of all influenza data. So it is a kind of a public platform which was created by World Health Organization back in 2008 where the countries decided that they are going to share all the data related to genome sequencing. 
So the question arises that, okay, even if you are going to share such genome sequencing, what we are going to get from that? So let's say we are sharing the data of genome sequencing related to COVID-19. It can actually tell us, first of all, that what has been the origin of that virus outbreak. Then we can get to know about the various strains which are in circulation. So we will develop the vaccine accordingly. And the third is that we can actually get to know about the root of transmission. So we can actually curtail the outbreak of the disease at the source of origin itself. However, sharing of such data has been abysmal because as highlighted in the article itself, for example, the Nipah virus. So we read about the Nipah virus outbreaks which was taking place in Kerala, 2018, 21, 23. So the recent Nipah virus outbreak in Kerala that was actually released on this GSET platform in the last month of May 2024. So this is the poor dissemination of data sharing which is taking place on a platform which has been created by World Health Organization. At the same time, in the recent time, if you look at it, there are rising cases of such zoonotic diseases and there are several factors which are responsible for it. The first is obviously the intensification of agriculture. So for example, 50% of the emerging zoonotic disease since 1940s, they are coming from what? They are coming from this agricultural intensification which we are doing. The second is over exploitation of wildlife. Then the urbanization and industry which has actually increased the human wildlife contacts. The fourth is the demand for animal or meat based consumption. So, for example, meat production has been increased to 60 percentage of time in the last 50 years. So, it is obvious that these viruses, bacteria, pathogens, they are actually getting an easy route to our body where they can actually adversely impact our health system. The other reasons are, for example, climate change. So, because of the global warming which is taking place, right? For example, as per the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the global temperature has increased by 1.2 degrees Celsius. Thus, it is providing ideal condition, which is basically warmer and wetter for these bacteria and viruses to th thrive. Then there is complex food supply chains which exist as well as now because we live in an urbanized or globalized world. So now, as it was very famously said by Elon Musk, the world has turned into a global village. So now there is a frequent traveling. So let's say at uh, in the time of 13 to 14th century, there was a Spanish influenza which had outbreak in the Europe, which actually is termed as Black Death and it led to the destruction of one by third population of Europe. But it was not transmitted or affected the Indian population of that time because we did not have such frequent traveling among the countries. So now if there is a disease which let's say uh, outbreaks in any particular city of China, just for the example, it can actually transmit it across the world in days of time. Thus, this zoonotic disease which has got various methods to spread such as vector borne, direct contact, indirect contact, they can be either food or water borne. These diseases can spread in magnanimous number at a very short span of time, thus compromising our health surveillance and infrastructure. So is there any particular steps which our country has taken in this regard? Yes, the Indian Council of Medical Research and Indian Council of Agriculture Research, they have come and created a kind of a joint research collaboration to promote the concept of One Health. What is the concept of One Health? One Health basically says that we need now not only to focus upon the health of humans because we are being impacted by the environment, for example, climate change. And as we can see that the health of animals are also important because many of the disease are being originated in them and then being transferred to us. That is the reason that ICMR and Indian Council of Agriculture Research have created a one platform where they are trying to detect and prevent such outbreak of diseases. For this purpose, India has also joined a joint strategic framework which has been created to protect such spread of zoonotic diseases by the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Health Organization, the World Organization on Animal Health and UNICEF. Then, India launched the Ministry of Health Affairs. It launched an integrated disease surveillance program back in 2004. 
where we are monitoring certain important diseases such as your dengue, chikungunya, your malaria, cholera, diphtheria, etc. And we are trying to prevent the outbreak of these diseases. Also, we created a kind of a roadmap to combat these zoonotic diseases as back in 2018. However, we can guess that with the spread of COVID-19 and the devastating impact it had on our lives as well as on our economy, we can guess that such roadmap was not adequately implemented. Thus, very recently, the government has created a center for One Health at Nagpur under the Indian Council of Medical Research. So we are trying to promote this concept of One Health as well as trying to protect the outbreaks of such viruses in the future. Also, the Niti Aayog has recently launched a Vision Health 2035 under which it is trying to create and educate public health surveillance in our country to protect outbreak of such disease. Now, it is obvious with the spread of COVID-19, which ravaged our economy for two and a half years, which led to the death of five to six millions as per the official data, it is obvious that there are certain important steps which can be taken as suggested by the article itself. So the first it talks about is that there needs to be a kind of an awareness generation among the larger public about this concept of One Health where we need to focus on three C's that is coordinating, communicating and collaborating. So it is obvious that if many of the disease are occurring from the zoonotic sources, the meat consumption can be declined. So for that purpose, let's say people can be made aware about the lab grown meat, which is basically not derived from the actual animals rather they are synthetically grown in the lab and it tastes as good as any non-veg the second is to regulate the antimicrobial resistance so because of indiscriminate use of medicines these viruses and bacteria they are actually growing resistant towards any kind of medicines which we are taking so for that purpose there can be shall be created an advocate infrastructure the third is to decentralize the diagnostic infrastructure so for example during the time of covid we created a kind of a decentralized infrastructure where we were doing such diagnosis at the level of state government hospitals district level hospitals we were creating uh, using private laboratories as well we were using various schools for the rapid checkups so why that practice cannot be continued and with collection of such data at the ground level, we can integrate this data with the public health ID system which can be created at a national level, which is also a kind of an initiative under the digital Ayushman Bharat. The next is to obviously provide accessible and affordable diagnostic test for NEPA, Ebola, etc. And to create a one health support units at a sub-district level. So on the basis of this discussion, try to solve this particular practice question. If possible, comment your answer in the comment box and we move forward to the next news. Various state governments has demanded recently for absolutely pure and honest judiciary, which is free of any kind of political biases. Such demand for an independent judiciary forms an important component of your GS2 paper under the larger theme of judiciary. So first to understand why there is such demand for independent judiciary, we need to understand its counterpart or the villain of the story that is a committed judiciary. What do we understand by committed judiciary? Committed judiciary is basically a kind of a judiciary which is aligned or subservient to the interest of the ruling government of the time or it is aligned with any particular political ideology. So, for example, such committed judiciary was actually deployed in United States of America back in 19th century. So, at that time, the Chief Justice of the US Federal Court, who used to be John Marshall, he actually kind of created a doctrine for his fellow judges, where they have to pass impartial judgments without having any kind of favor or alignment with the demands of the government. So this was obviously objected by the then president Thomas Jefferson, who was the third president of United States of America, and he was in the office from 1801 to 1809. 
सो थॉमस जेफरसन स्टार्टेड द प्रैक्टिस वेयर ही स्टार्टेड अपॉइंटिंग द जजेस हु आर काइंड ऑफ हिज क्लोज फ्रेंड्स एंड दस दे कुड पास फेवरेबल जजमेंट एज पर द नीड ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट the question arises that has such practice of undermining the independence of judiciary has ever been targeted or deployed in our country the answer is indeed yes as we are celebrating the 50 years of proclamation of emergency we need to understand that there was a ongoing tussle which was taking place between the indira gandhi government and the judiciary back in 1960s and 70s The idea actually started from the first prime minister of our country itself Jawaharlal Nehru who once infamously said that no judiciary can stand over the sovereign will of the entire community and thus it was his government itself who bought the first constitutional amendment act of 1951 under which the ninth schedule of the constitution was added which actually made that if government is passing any law which is acting as a contradiction to the fundamental rights of the people they are kind of have a blanket immunity from any kind of judicial review so we were talking about the tussle which was taking place between the indira gandhi government and the judiciary many of the judgments which was actually passed at that time it contradicted the policies of the government for example the rc cooper case of 1969 which was against the nationalization of the banks which was done in the year of 1969 then the keshwanand bharti case of 1973 which created a kind of a basic structure doctrine and put a kind of a curtailing power on the constitutional amendment powers of the government then the madhav rao sindhya case versus union of india 1975 was actually dealing with the privy purses abolition which was done by indira gandhi Ultimately the final straw was drawn in the Raj Narayan verdict of 1975 where the Indira Gandhi's election to the Lok Sabha was declared null and void and because of that reason Indira Gandhi moved towards creation of a committed judiciary in our country so to understand that first understand that under article 124 of our constitution it says that the chief justice of india shall be appointed by the president and any other judges will be appointed by the president in consultation with the chief justice of india so before 1973 there used to take place a precedent where the oldest judge of the supreme court he used to become the chief justice of india but indira gandhi violated this principle and she appointed an ray who at that time superseded three senior judges and remember that these three senior judges were involved in the judgment of keshwanand bharti case which was against the government so an ray superseded three senior most judges of the court at that time and he became the chief justice of india from 1973 to 77 then a very close aide of nehru gandhi family who was mh beg he was appointed as chief justice of india from 1977 to 78 because he actually upheld the proclamation of emergency which was declared by indira gandhi in adm jabalpur case of 1978 so thus as you can see there exists now a committed bureaucracy now what is the harmful impact of such committed bureaucracy So to take that an example let's say that government of the day passes a law tomorrow where it declares some of your fundamental right as unconstitutional or invalid it basically violates your fundamental right let's say your fundamental right to choose your life partner so it says under a new law that now you don't have any authority to choose your life partner it is obvious that this law is violating the principles of the constitution For example under article 13 if there exists any law which violates the fundamental right that law has to be declared unconstitutional or null and void also under article 32 of the constitution the judiciary has got this power to judicial review any such law which has been passed by the government but because there exists a committed judiciary then the judiciary is not going to take any cognizance of any such act which has been passed by the government and thus now you will have to marry if the partner which have, which will be selected by your family you cannot do any kind of love marriages 
So even though your fundamental right is getting violated, judiciary can turn completely blind side towards that if it is committed to the idea of the government. This actually violates the separation of power. The doctrine of separation of power, which was actually led by the philosopher Montesquieu, where he said that there shall exist a system of checks and balances between the three important organs of the government, that is executive, legislature and your judiciary. Now, this legislature can pass a no confidence motion against the executive at any given point of time. If the executive or the council of ministers does not have any confidence in the parliament, which means that they have become unreflective of the demands of the public. Also, this executive can dissolve the legislature at any given point of time with the resignation of the prime minister. So, legislature and executive kind of controlling each other. At the same time, judiciary can pass judicial review under Article 32 to declare any law which has been passed by the legislature as unconstitutional. And it can also pass mandamus or writs under Article 32 for or against the executive. The executive on the other hand, for example, your president has the power to appoint the judiciary. And the judges of the Supreme Court can be impeached by the legislature. Thus, in our constitution, we have created a kind of a system of checks and balances, which is integral to enhance the accountability and equality. So, it basically ensures that there exists a rule of law as it was envisaged under Article 14 of the constitution. Then it ensures the decentralization of power and, and it actually provides the voice to the people. To understand all of this, we are going to take an example. So let's say that you guys might have heard about the Anman and Nicobar project, development project which is taking place, the great Nicobar project. Now the government is trying to create some transshipment ports there, some mega cities there. But that can actually lead to, as per the report of Niti Aayog itself, failing of 9.5 lakh trees. So it is going to have devastating impact on environment. Also, it can impact the biodiversity of the region. So for example, there are certain rare species which are found there, such as your great leatherback turtle. So it can diminish the population of such rare species, decline the biodiversity. Also, it is going to significantly impact the fundamental rights such as Article 19 and Article 21 of the indigenous tribes which are living in that region such as your Shompen tribe. Now, if there is taking place such devastating impact on environment and the fundamental rights of the people, at this point of time, if there exists a committed judiciary, it is just going to turn blind side or blind eye towards these provision and let this act completely pass. Thus, it is obvious that at this particular stage, we require an independent judiciary. We can actually check and balance any such law which is being passed by the government of the day. This was exactly what was asked in the PYQ, where it asked about which one of the following factors constitute the best safeguard of liberty. Obviously, committed judiciary is not one of them. Centralization of power is not and just a mere elected government cannot show that. So there exists a separation of power as it was envisaged by the philosopher Montesquieu. Thus, our constitution actually provides for such independent judiciary. And there are certain constitutional provisions which specifically provides that. So for example, our constitution says that there shall exist a security of tenure for the judges of the Supreme Court. So, the working age of Supreme Court judges are mentioned as 65 years and before that they can only be removed by the process of impeachment and for such impeachment process a majority is required which is basically a special majority that is basically the majority of the total membership of the house and two by third of the member present and voting. The second provision is that the salaries, pensions and allowances of the Supreme Court judge under Article 125 of the Constitution that is charged on the Consolidated Fund of India and thus it cannot be significantly reduced by the Parliament. The third is that under Article 138 of the Constitution, the Supreme Court judges 
power and jurisdiction it can be only expanded by the parliament and it cannot be diminished at all also under article 129 of the constitution the supreme court has the power of contempt of court so basically if there has been some judgment which has been passed by the supreme court and that has not been followed by the executive or the parliament then the court can actually punish them under the contempt of court also there exists a kind of a constitutional prevention where the conduct of judges cannot be discussed by the parliament on their exchange of duties unless and until such impeachment motion is being considered and finally under article 50 which is basically a directive principle of state policy there exists a constitutional directive to the state that there will be a kind of a separation which will exist between executive and judiciary and this was exactly the question which was asked in your pre previous year prelims paper now the question arises that has there been any recent steps which has been taken by the government of the day to undermine the authority of the judiciary the answer to that is yes with the national judicial appointment commission to understand that let's first understand the judges cases so it is obvious that the as per the president the chief justice of india will be appointed by the president and other judges will be appointed on the consultation with chief justice of india which is basically a kind of a unique feature of the constitution however to undermine such independence of the judiciary there was a kind of a judgment which was actually passed by the supreme court itself where it said that such consultation with chief justice of india by the president it does not mean concurrence and thus constitution does not provide for cgi's primacy that ultimately led to the judges cases where in the first judges case it was held that the president will appoint only those judges which will be based upon the recommendation of the Chief Justice of India and Chief Justice of India will uh, try to have the advice of two senior Supreme Court judges. Then in the second judges case, this was actually extended from two judges of Supreme Court to four judges of Supreme Court. Thus now there is Chief Justice of India, four senior judges of Supreme Court and thus they form a kind of a collegium system a collegium system which gives the recommendation to the president and the president has to adhere to this advice which has been given by the chief justice of india then there was a venkat chalia commission in the year of 2002 which actually recommended a five member national judicial appointment commission to replace this collegium system thus the government brought an act of njac 2014 However, this act was declared as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, which held in S.P. Gupta case that the independence of judiciary is the basic structure of the constitution and the independence of judiciary is an integral part of it. Thus, this whole process of collegium system, it keeps uh, occurring in the news just remember these important debates related to the independence of judiciary for your mains examination and try to attempt this particular question which is a pyq which appeared in your mains examination of 2023 we move forward to the next news now adhering to a plea which was passed by the central bureau of investigation the delhi's chief minister has been sent for the judicial custody for 15 days what is this concept of judicial custody? Is there exist a kind of a difference between the judicial and the police custody? We will learn that and much more in this particular section which aligns to your GS2 paper theme of judiciary. Let's first try to understand what are the different provisions of arrest in our country. These provisions which are encoded in your Code of Criminal Procedure or CRPC Act of 1973 where specifically the section 41 under chapter 5 of CRPC deals with the various provisions related to the arrest of an accused person and the rights which are available to that particular person. Now recently the government has brought the Bharatiya Nagrik Suraksha Samita of 2023 under which the CRPC is now being transformed into this with changes in almost 160 sections. Now, as we have understood that there are certain law abided courts which has been created and under that the arrest of a person is regulated. Let's try to understand the rights of an arrested person. 
what do we understand by the term arrest here arrest basically means that if the police realizes that there is a particular person who has been accused of certain crime then the moment of that person has to be curtailed or arrest now such curtailment can be done on various provision first either that that person's if it will allow free hand that person can commit any other crime or if the person will be allowed free hand it can actually just kind of tamper with the evidences which is very much required by the police to prove the case in the court and file the charge sheet thus this is the whole basis which forms behind your arrest the second is that is there any rights which are provided to this arrested person so these rights has been provided under article 22 of the constitution as a fundamental right so any person under the right against uh, detention it has the right to be informed about the grounds of the arrest and to be defended by a legal practitioner then such accused person first will have to be produced before the judicial magistrate within the 24 hours of arrest including the traveling time so for example just remember the case of Vikas Dubey who was arrested by the Lucknow police and they were just taking them to the judicial magistrate just between then something happened the somehow miraculously the car just turned down and Vikas Dubey was killed then now let's say if Vikas Dubey was produced before the judicial magistrate if the judicial magistrate would have found enough and ample evidences that yes there are certain crimes which has been committed by the Vikas Dubey only then he could have been detained further or remanded otherwise he could have released so any arrest after 24 hours it can be done only on the authority of the magistrate Remember that such rights are not available to those people who are arrested under preventive detention. Preventive detention in the case that you have already committed a crime and let's say you have got punishment for that. Now some circumstances has appeared in a particular district or in a country where the government realizes that you can actually again get involved in such crime and the government has detained you for the preventive purposes then these rights are not available to you which means that now when I am getting arrested I will not be informed about the grounds of arrest the next is that there shall be a compulsory examination which shall be done by the doctor so we have understood about the legal provisions of arrest we have understood about the rights which are available to this accused person now let's try to understand what is a police custody so let's say there was a particular person who has been arrested by the police so he was accused of such crime and the police has arrested him now the police will have to do an investigation to find out that whether the accused has actually done those crimes or not many a times there is a possibility that such investigation cannot be completed within the 24 hours also under the article 22 then the police will take that accused and produce him before the magistrate where the police will actually ask for the court to provide the police cert some extra time to actually do the investigation this is provided under section 167 of CRPC where you will be held under the police custody for the time period of maximum of 15 days under which the police has to do the investigation and after 15 days you will be again produced after the court in which police will have to show certain substantial evidences against you right now till this time when you are be being held in police custody you will be confined in the lockup which you see in the police stations or the custody of the police officer but the problem is that many a times let's say for the normal people obviously they do not even have a good lawyer they do not even have that much of money to have access to them many of these people majority of our country are actually unaware about their rights which are provided under article 22 of the constitution so that actually leads to the heinous cases of torture or kind of mismanagement which takes place in the police custody so for example we can see the number of registered cases of death which has happened across the country as per the data of 2022 because of which many of these uh, senior or high level politicians actors they actually do not want to remain in police custody and thus they ask for judicial custody so let's try to understand this process when i am being taken to the police case, police custody i am being held there for 15 days 
then the police said that no this person has done uh, various kind of crimes it's a very complex case this person is actually a mastermind thank you now the police says that i want some extra time so as per the law the police has maximum of 90 days to file a charge sheet if the police is unable to do that then as per the supreme court itself bail is the rule and the jail can only be an exception right now, as per under the Bharatiya Nagrik Sahita, which is being launched now, the police custody can be authorized in the parts as well. So now, basically, the police has got extra 40 to 60 days to do the investigation. In this time period, when police is doing the investigation, now I will not be held up in police custody. Rather, I will be held up where? In your judicial custody. So what is the major differences? The major differences is that in police custody, the accused is being confined at lockup or remains in the custody of the officer. In judicial custody, however, the accused is detained under the purview of judicial magistrate and thus he is locked in a central or a state prison. When I was in police custody, it is obvious that the investig investigating authority can interrogate the accused anytime they want. They can do any kind of tortures or things like that. However, when I'm in judicial custody, now these officials require permission of the court for questioning me. And also I have the right to remain silent under Article 21 of the Constitution. Then the police custody, I had certain basic rights under Article 22, such as right to legal counsel and inform on the grounds which I have been arrested. Under judicial custody, now my rights will be governed by the prison manual which is provided. So the police will have to follow all of that. Under your Bharti Nagrik Nyaya Sahita, now this judicial custody can be extended up to 90 days and the bail has been provided under the chapter 33. So these are the major differences which takes place between the judicial and the police custody. Remember these important facts and try to solve this previous prelims here question of 2021. We move forward to the next news. The article actually highlights the economic issues which are prevailing in Kenya which has been caused by the International Monetary Fund is Structural Adjustment Program. This International Monetary Fund and this Structural Adjustment Program forms an important component of your GS2 paper under the larger theme of important international institutions. So let's first have a quick overlook about the International Monetary Fund. What is it? It is basically an institution which was created to provide finances and loans to various developing and low income countries. When back in Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, which basically took place in New Hampshire in USA. So from Bretton Woods Conference, two important institutions were born. One is your World Bank and other is your International Monetary Fund. The headquarter of International Monetary Fund is where? It is in your Washington DC and currently it has 190 members. What is the importance of this information? Remember that international monetary funds provide whatever the financial services which we were discussing or the loans only to its member countries. So only these 190 member countries has the access to the financial assistance provided by the international monetary fund. Now, when we have discussed that, we will try to understand another concept that is a special drawing rights. What is a special drawing rights? See, basically, let's say there were three countries, A, B and C. Now, obviously, these A, B and C countries, let's say that is USA, China and India. And USA, India and China obviously will have certain savings which they would have done. So, for example, they have kept certain foreign exchanges reserves with them for the stability of their economy because each and every country in this globalized world is either buying or selling some of the products. For that, we need to have some amount of reserves which we keep, which actually forms our import cover. So, for example, India has around nine months of import cover currently. Now, let's say that India kept all of these foreign exchange reserves in only one currency that is US dollar. But due to some economic crisis which took place as 2008 global financial crisis which took place, the value of US dollar, it declined significantly. So thus it will lead to obvious that now we will have loss of savings. So whatever the savings which we did, the value of that, the amount of that declined significantly. 
Thus, to prevent this and to create an alternate kind of funds, these special drawing, drawing rights were created. The special drawing rights are basically the international reserve assets which has been created by the IMF to supplement the official reserves of the member countries. So basically what we did now that these three countries, US, China and India, they kind of created a club. A club which is your special drawing rights. Here now they have holding various currencies which are basically how many five currencies what are these five currencies us dollars your china's renminbi your japanese yen your pound sterling all of that so even if the value of one currency is going to decline it is not going to impact our total number of reserves do we count these special drawing rights in our foreign exchange reserves absolutely Remember that these SDRs, they are allocated to the IMF member countries in the proportion of their relative share in the IMF. This relative share in the IMF is basically a kind of a subscription method. So each and every country has have kind of a voting share. That voting share is decided on the basis of how much subscription you have in the IMF. That is decided on various factors. So first of all, whenever a country is joining, IMF, it will provide certain amount to the IMF. The second will be that how much openness your economy has. The third is the kind of government you are having. So on the basis of all these informations, you will be provided a certain quota of votes. That quota of votes is also decided on how much SDR or special drawing rights you have. So remember, this SDR is not a currency in itself, rather a claim on the basket of currency. And that plays a very important role in the voting share we have in the IMF. Currently, India has around 2.63% of voting share because we have SDR of 13,144 million SDR, right? Which country has the highest? USA followed by Japan and then there is China. So thus India currently has around 13th largest voting share in the IMF. So when we have understood about this SDR, the next concept which we'll understand about is the structural adjustment program. So let's say there are two countries, both of these countries go to IMF and ask for some money. The first country is basically a country which is facing certain serious medium term balance of payment crisis. So basically, let's say as a country, I was dependent on import of oil. Now I do not have any foreign exchange reserves left with me to pay for this importing of oil, which I was doing. So I am basically facing a what? A balance of payment crisis. So I go to the IMF and I ask for their extended fund facility under which the IMF will tell me that, okay, we are going to provide you certain uh, money for sure. From where? From this SDR, which the countries are keeping with them, right? So we are going to provide you that. But in return of that, you will have to do certain structural reforms to address your economic weaknesses. Now, there will be conditional disbursement, which will be based upon quantitative performance. So the structural reforms, which IMF will suggest you, how you are performing on that, on the basis of that, IMF will be uh, giving you the next quota of the loan. This can extend up to three to four years and at least 5% of that will be based upon the special drawing rights. So let's say another country went there, which is a low income country, the second country. That country is also facing a medium term BOP crisis. Now here, because it's a low income country, it is part of a poverty reduction and growth trust program of IMF where the IMF will say that you will have to do structural reform to address your economic weakness and for that IMF will itself lay down a strategy. So here it was only suggesting for some structural reform in extended fund facility but in extended credit facility the IMF is saying that you will have to follow the PRG strategy which will be laid by the IMF itself. Here, there will not be any conditional disbursement and such loan will be provided for three to five years. In the first case, there was an interest of 5% based upon SDR. In the second case, there is 0% interest rate. Now, when we have understood about this extended credit facility, which has been provided to the low income country, let's try to take a case study of Kenya.
So Kenya was also facing a similar kind of balance of payment crisis and thus it approached International Monetary Fund to ask for certain loans. The IMF provided up to 3.6 billion dollar loan by the year of May 2023. And because it is providing this loan, it is now going for what? For poverty reduction and growth trust strategy. And thus now Kenya will have to do certain structural reforms. What are these structural reforms which were actually imposed on Kenya? The first was that the Kenya has to increase its revenue collection up to 25% of GDP. So that means what? That means tax hikes and budget cuts. This, then it will have to eliminate the subsidies which it is providing to its poor section or to the farmers and it will also have to cut the subsidies on fuel so the prices of fuel will increase at the same time when the government is already charging the public a lot in the form of taxes then IMF said that you will have to do the cuts on education and health as well so that basically kind of rattled the economy of Kenya much further and the government of Kenya it actually passed a bill where it was trying to increase the taxes and because of which the protest has erupted very recently which has been in the news. And these are the problematic issues which are associated with this Bretton Woods institution and that was the reason that the Times uh, magazine back in 1994 called these World Bank and IMF as the overlords of Africa because of their lending facilities. And this is the similar debt trap strategy which has been adopted by China as well. So keep these important facts in your mind and we move forward to the next news where we are going to read about a very interesting scheme called as interest equalization scheme. Why it has been in the news? Because the Department of Commerce has extended the interest equalization scheme for the MSME exporters as well, for the micro, small, medium exporters, which forms an important component of your prelims paper under the larger theme of economy. Let's first try to understand what is this interest equalization scheme. It was launched in the year of 2015 under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry where it kinds of provide a subsidy or the rate of interest equalization on both pre and post shipment exports and this interest equalization is provided by the government in Indian currency that is rupees. Also, which are the monitoring agencies which regulate over this interest equalization scheme. So that is your Director General of Foreign Trade as well as Reserve Bank of India. So basically Reserve Bank of India regulates the public sector banks as well as private sector banks who can provide this credit to these exporters. Now, this scheme was about to end by 30th of June 2024 for all the other exporters, but only specifically for your micro, small and medium industry uh, enterprises exporters, it has been extended till 31st of August this year. Now, what are the benefits which are provided by such interest equalization scheme? The first is obviously that it will enhance the competitiveness of our export. So, if this uh, equalization was not being provided by the government, our products would have become much more costlier in the foreign markets. Thus, we would not have been able to compete with the economies such as Bangladesh and Vietnam. So, it, it will obviously ensure the competitiveness of our products in the international markets. Then, because competitiveness will increase, our exports will increase as well, especially made by the MSME sector such as apparels, handicrafts, handlooms. It can also encourage the employment generation in your labor intensive MSMEs as well as the textile sector will obviously get the assistance of most of these interest equalization scheme approximately of around 1000 crore. So keep this scheme in your mind for the prelims as well as you can use it when you are writing about the MSME sector in your main answer. We move forward to the next section where we are going to cover some important news which will actually help you to eliminate some important statements in your prelims examination. So let's start with the first news. The first news talks about the Dalat Beg Oldie Road. Why it has been in the news? Because recently the T-72 tank which was carrying the Indian Army soldiers, it got stuck in the high current of this Shiok River here. And because of which, five soldiers actually lost their lives. This incident took place in this Dalat Beg Oldie area. This Dalat Beg Oldie area which forms the part of Eastern Ladakh here 
and it is around just 10 kilometers west from the line of actual control which is passing from here so you guys can see here in detail about the line of actual control here and here is your Dalat Beg Oldi area this is your Karakoram Pass here the Siachin Glacier the much important Nubra River flows here you guys can see the flowing Shok River the Shok River which is basically the tributary of the larger Indus River and the this is the Aksai Chin area or the area which was illegally occupied by China back in the year of 1962. And here is your lies, your Pangong Taso Lake which has been in the region of dispute near your Galwan Valley. So remember these important maps in your mind for prelims. We move forward to the next news where we are going to talk about the Financial Services Institution Bureau that is FSIB. Why it has been in the news? Because recently it appointed the chairman of certain public sector banks. So it is responsible to select the chairman of PSBs and the insurance sector. It is functions under the Department of Financial Services, where it is composed of chairperson who is basically the nominee of a central government, a secretary of the Department of Financial Services, a chairman of Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority of India and the deputy governor of RBI. Keep this in mind, not the governor, but the deputy governor. The final decision. So is the final decision lies with the Financial Services Institutional Bureau itself? No, it can only recommend recommend for the chairperson the final decision lies with the appointment committee of cabinet which is obviously chaired by whom by the prime minister earlier the same decision used to be made by bank board bureau on the basis of this just try to attempt this question we move forward to the next news the next news where we are going to talk about the in stem fabric what is in stem in stem is basically the institute for steam cell science and regenerative medicine who have made what? They have made an anti-insecticide fabric. So basically, let's say there is a farmer and that farmer is uh, just distributing the pesticides in his farm. Now, because of that, the exposure to these pesticides, it can lead to chronic health effect. But the InSteam has created a kind of a fabric which is anti-insecticide, which means it can utilize the impact of phosphate-based pesticides on the farmer thus to improve the health of the farmer. Remember this important fact and we move forward to the last news of the day which is about Prahari portal. The Prahari portal which has been released by the Ministry of Women and Child Welfare. To do what? To provide quarterly activities of awareness on the substance drug abuse especially which is taking place in the schools. So, for example, you guys can see here the school uh, children, the small young age people of our country who forms the part of our demographic dividend, how they are wasting their lives in the consumption of various drugs. To create awareness among them, this Prahari portal has been created. And at the same time, the government is trying to create certain Prahari clubs which will be managed and run by the children themselves. So keep these important details in your mind and with this we have reached to the end of our discussion today. Do not forget to attempt the questions at the end of the video and test your knowledge. We will meet in a very interesting discussion very soon. Till then all the very best for your preparation and thank you.